Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Leviticus, beginning to read chapter 9, verse 23. It's Leviticus 9, 23, through to chapter 10, 20. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honoured. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle, Aziel, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, do not let your hair become unkempt and do not tear your clothes or you will die and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting or you will die because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. The Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean and so you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. Moses said to Aaron and his remaining sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, take the grain offering left over from the food offerings prepared without yeast and presented to the Lord and eat it beside the altar, for it is most holy. Eat it in the sanctuary area because it is your share and your son's share of the food offerings presented to the Lord, for so I have been commanded. But you and your sons and your daughters may eat the breast that was waved and the thigh that was presented. Eat them in a ceremonially clean place. They've been given to you and your children as your share of the Israelites' fellowship offerings. The thigh that was presented and the breast that was waved must be brought with the fat portions of the food offerings to be waved before the Lord as a wave offering. This will be the perpetual share for you and your children, as the Lord has commanded. When Moses inquired about the goat of the sin offering and found that it had been burned, he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's remaining sons, and asked, why didn't you eat the sin offering in the sanctuary area? It is most holy. It was given to you to take away the guilt of the community by making atonement for them before the Lord. Since its blood was not taken into the holy place, you should have eaten the goat in the sanctuary area, as I commanded. Aaron replied to Moses, Today they sacrifice their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, but such things as this have happened to me. Would the Lord have been pleased if I had eaten the sin offering today? When Moses said that, heard this, he was satisfied. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, we pray that we would indeed still our hearts 
that, Lord, that we would hear your word, that we would come this morning expecting to hear your spirit speak to our hearts, enlarge our vision of you, and, Lord, create in us a clean heart that we may offer to you pure living sacrifices. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You might want to turn back in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 10. So let me start. Why do you wear a seatbelt? Well, for some, especially if you're international, it's because I told you to. Um, But for others, well, because it's the law. But I would reckon that for most of us, we wear a seatbelt because we want to stay safe and alive. I think people probably put them on these days by second nature. But you know what? It's not always been the case. So throughout the 70s and the 80s, we had TV personalities exhorting us to clunk click every trip. Those of you of a certain age will remember this. There was plenty of slow motion adverts of people hurtling through windscreens or peaches being smashed with claw hammers just to reinforce the point that it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt. Now, eventually, in 1983, it became law to wear a seatbelt in the front seats. It wasn't until 1991 that it became law for everyone, front and back, to wear a seatbelt where there was one fitted. And I remembered I didn't have seatbelts in the back of my car, but hey-ho. Now, have a look at this map. I think this map says it all. This is road traffic deaths across the world. And the darker the country, the more deaths that occur. I don't know what's going on in Libya. But I think where we see that there are no traffic laws or weakly enforced laws, there is much more deaths happen. But I think that we wear our seatbelts, like I said, not because it's the law, but because we've developed a culture of safety, which is protected by laws and regulations. Now, perhaps by now, you might have spotted that Leviticus is a book full of laws and regulations. And they're not there to limit God's people's fun, like some kind of theological red tape or ecclesiastical bureaucracy. These laws and regulations are there for a holy God to keep his people safe in his presence, to make a way for sinful people to come before their God. So chapter 8, Aaron and his sons had gone through a lengthy and exact process, being purified and cleansed and clothed for service, all that stuff. They spent seven days getting ready for the big day to serve God's people. Then in chapter 9, we saw that the great and glorious day had finally arrived. The day that the brand new sanctuary began to function. This was day 8. It was finally open for business. The inaugural service for all those sacrifices that we've been looking at for the first seven chapters of the book. There you are, verse 24. Even fire came out from the presence of the Lord himself and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell down. This would be a day of days. This was going to be the greatest event since the crossing of the Red Sea. Surely this was going to be a day to remember. So now, still on day eight, Verse 1, Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu's turn. They step up to perform their part of the service, the bit they were responsible for. So they took their censers and they put fire in them. Then they added some incense. Ooh, and then what? And they offered unauthorised fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. What? Unauthorised fire, illegal fire, strange fire, fire contrary to the Lord's regulations. And look where they're doing it, right in front of the Lord's face. So what happens? So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died. 
the exact same thing happened to the whole burnt offering in 924. The same exact words. Instead of bringing a burnt offering, Nadab and Abihu became burnt offerings. A moment ago, men fell down in worship on their faces amid shouts of joy. Now, Nadab and Abihu fall down in death on what is left of their faces in total silence. So we might be asking ourselves, why? Why did God's judgment come and consume them so suddenly, so quickly, without warning? Now, commentators have debated, long debated, what this strange fire was. And to be honest, no one's exactly sure. But the ambiguity is part of the whole point that the text is making here. You see, it doesn't exactly matter what they did or didn't do. It was something that God had not commanded. They were doing their own thing. They were pleasing themselves, ignoring God's word, not being watchful of the words that he had commanded them. You see, the whole narrative since chapter 8 has led us to expect that those engaged in the Lord's service are going to be watchful in that service, that they're going to obey the law of the Lord promptly and exactly. Suddenly, they're confronted with Aaron's sons doing that which was not commanded. Their fire did not please the Lord. They were pleasing themselves for whatever reason, not being watchful to what was commanded. Now, maybe you're starting to clutch the arms of your seat right now thinking, I have those moments when I ignore God and when I simply please myself. But we're not talking about the sin that besets us every day. The whole point of the sacrificial system that we've had at the beginning of this book has been looking at that Nadab and Abihu were also sinful people by the fact they were part of sinful humanity. But they'd been consecrated and they had been atoned for. It wasn't just that sinful humanity. I think Moses points out what is at issue in verse 3 when he says, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honoured. God judged Nadab and Abihu because the honour of God's name was at stake. God had revealed himself as one jealous about his honour and now was only acting in a way that was consistent with his holiness. To have done anything else would have to raised questions about whether God was really so pure, so alert, so powerful, so bothered about his name as Israel had been led to believe. You see, God is serious about the honour of his name. We just prayed it. Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name, Lord. That is what we pray every Sunday. His holiness is not something to be trifled with. Presumption about this can prove fatal, as Nadab and Abihu found out. Well, let's take Uzzah, another person in the Bible. When the Ark of the Covenant is brought up from the house of Abinadab up to Jerusalem on a cart, one of the oxes stumbles. The Ark totters and looks like it's about to fall onto the ground. So Uzzah, another son of a priest, puts his hand out and touches the ark to stop it falling, to steady it. And then, bang, the Lord struck him dead. What heights of presumption that Uzzah thought that his hand was cleaner and purer than the ground and the dirt on which the ark was going to fall. And you know what? If people had been following God's instructions in the first place, this would never have happened. 
The Ark should never have been on a cart. It had rings on the side, so you could put 16-foot-long poles through, and it was supposed to be carried, so you could keep your distance from the Ark, rather than getting your grubby, sinful hands all over it. Or then, just because maybe we think we're in the New Testament period, that somehow we're safer. But Ananias and Sapphira, well, they presumed that they could give God a half-baked offering to the church leaders. When in essence, their offering was to the Holy Spirit, was to a holy God. They thought, oh, I'm just doing some work for the church, a bit of money for the church. But they did not weigh up that it was a holy, awesome God who they were serving. Their service was tainted with lies and deception. They weren't watchful of the one they were serving. They treated God lightly. They did not take his glory and holiness seriously. And soon they also found out to their cost that God takes his glory seriously, very seriously. So the question perhaps we need to be asking ourselves is, do we take our service to the Lord seriously? Do we give due weight to his name, to his glory, to the one whom we serve as we serve? Are we being watchful of the one we serve? Or is it all a bit of take it or leave it? Do we give mixed offerings in our service? A bit of what the Lord might like and a bit of what I might fancy. I'll serve in the kids' ministry, but only every fifth week in the month. I'll come to church on Sunday, but if the family turn up, well, then I won't. You see, recently we signed our membership covenant forms. Maybe you're one of those that just took it and signed it and handed it back in. You need to be more watchful about what you are getting into, who the God is that you are serving. Or perhaps you are one who quibbled over every single detail on that form. Well, you need to be more reverent and listen to what God has called you to. Do you know what? After the death of Ananias and Sapphira, people feared to join the church. People knew membership was a serious business. Church membership is not like gym membership. You don't just rock up and use the facilities when you feel like it. We need to look again at our holy God and what he demands of us. One of the functions of the priesthood was to teach and instruct God's people. We see that there in verse 11. Nadab and Abihu did function in their role of teaching all Israel. It was the last function they ever performed and they did it in a very dramatic and violent way. But the lesson was learned. Don't treat a holy God lightly. Now, in my childhood, and if you're a similar age to me, we used to have lots of films, those public service adverts on the TV, and they focused on keeping us as kids safe. The pictures might remind you. The dangers of flying kites near high-tension power cables, or walking on railway lines, or breaking into building sites, or throwing fireworks. Now, I was glad I had a black and white TV because they were pretty graphic. But the effect was just as powerful. And me and my friends at least made it into adulthood because we realised the dangers of messing about with these things. We don't show those adverts anymore because we don't want to frighten the children. But do we also, as Christians, also avoid passage of Scripture like this? Maybe we find passages about Nadab and Abihu, or Azza, or Ananias and Sapphira, uncomfortable, disturbing, even frightening. But we are called to preach the full counsel of God. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let us be thoroughly equipped for every good work as we look at this passage. Now, in the film, Saving Private Ryan, Capazzo was killed by a German sniper while he was trying to rescue this French family. 
At the same time, he was arguing with his commanding officer, Captain Miller. And then we see, a few scenes later, the entire squad stands around in mournful silence around their dead comrade. And what does Captain Miller say to them? He says, pointing at Capazzo's lifeless body, he says, this is why we follow orders. If Capazzo had done what Miller had said, maybe he would have remained alive. If he'd been watchful, his ministry may not have ended so suddenly. You see, Miller wasn't being heartless to the French family or insensitive to Capazzo's compassion. He wanted everyone to live. But the way to do that was to listen to his orders, to trust that the one in charge maybe knew better than they did. This morning, we stand around the bodies of Nadab and Abihu, Uzza, Ananias and Sapphira. This is why we follow God's word. If they'd all been a little bit more watchful to God's orders and acknowledged the weight of his nature, their ministries and their lives might not have ended so tragically. Their bodies would not have been carried out of the camp and dumped so unceremoniously in the sacred ashes of the altar or the incinerated remains of the sacrifices where they were disposed of. Maybe for us, Moses' instructions in verse 6 to Aaron about not mourning might seem horribly harsh. But these instructions witness not to an unfeeling God, but rather to an appreciation of right priorities. Captain Miller's words might have seemed harsh, but if further death was to be prevented, the focus had to return to the job in hand. Aaron had put the service, had to put the service of God first, even before the concerns of family and self. As the representative of Israel, he needed to remain focused on his responsibilities. The very lives of the whole community hung in the balance now. If this high priest did not continue with the sacrifice, then there would be no forgiveness of sins for God's people. They could not become before their God. And the command to Aaron is no different to the response that Jesus gave to the man who asked to bury his father before embarking on the path of discipleship. Jesus told him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. There's an urgency about the work of God. There's an urgency about what we've been called to serve that gives a priority over everything else and that insists that his servants should not divert their energies to attend to lesser matters. How then can they hear? How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed? How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? That is what we've been called to. So then in verse 8, the Lord speaks to Aaron. The only place in Leviticus where the Lord personally speaks to Aaron. And God uses this this situation to remind Aaron again of the core responsibilities of he and his sons had accepted when they became priests. Verse 9, you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink. Whenever you go to the tent of meeting or you will die. So if alcohol had played a part in Nahab and Abihu's death, the text doesn't say, then I think the results would have been an object lesson enough. They could never have been a more teachable time as this. You see, the point is, not that Aaron and his sons could not drink alcohol ever, just not while on duty. Or let's return to our road safety illustration. Why do we not drink and drive? Is it simply because it's the law? No, we don't drink and drive because we want to keep alert on the road. We want to keep ourselves and other road users safe and alive. We want to stay focused to any dangers that might come in our direction. And we certainly don't want to cause a horrific crash. 
It's the same in the Christian life. We want, to invo- we want to avoid things that will cloud our judgment. We need to be clear-headed as we can. We need to be able to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the clean and the unclean. Now, alcohol in the Bible, in many ways, it is a metaphor for things that cause us to become sleepy, inattentive and fuzzy-headed. What do you fill your mind with? What are you reading? What are you watching? What, who are you listening to? The New Testament is full of exhortations to be watchful, to be on your guard, to be sober-minded. Three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told the disciples to be on their guard, to be watchful and pray. And they weren't. Some betrayed, some denied, and some just ran away. You see, what goes in must come out. If leaders are to teach the Israelites all the decrees of the Lord, then they ought to make sure that they're not filling themselves with all manner of rubbish that will impede the service to which they are called. We need to think about what it is that we're ingesting. All of us belong to that royal priesthood. Now, I know as a minister standing here at the front, there is a greater weight on me as I'm preaching, but we're all ministers at one level or another. We're all those priests. We need to be watchful. We need to be on our guard. We need to be sober-minded. Perhaps if Nadab and Abihu had been more watchful and on their guard, they might not have fallen so catastrophically. But then we come to the end, verses 12 to 15, and everything seems to be going back on track. God's talking to Aaron. Moses is talking to Aaron and the remaining sons. The sanctuary hasn't completely sunk. It still seems to be on track. And then we have this this strange thing happening in verse 16. Moses discovers that instead of the priests properly eating the remainder of the purification offerings on behalf of the people, the priests have instead incinerated it. They've not done what they were supposed to do. So Moses hits the roof, verse 16, undoubtedly expecting that Eliezer and Ithamar were just as reckless as their dead brothers. What on earth is the matter with this generation? Can't they do anything right? And the question is left for us. Why didn't Eliezer and Ithamar go the way of Nadab and Abihu? And I think the answer lies in Aaron's reply to Moses in verse 19. Would the Lord have been pleased if I had eaten the sin offering today? Aaron focuses on what was pleasing to the Lord. Aaron was watchful of himself and his God. Aaron humbled himself before his Lord. He recognised his own sinful frailty and that of his family. And he rightly weighed his holy God and understood what truly pleased the Lord. And when Moses heard what Aaron had said, He was pleased, and we can infer that the Lord was pleased. As God said to Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement. That is discernment of God rather than burnt offerings. Perhaps God is more gracious to those who make mistakes because they fear him than those who carelessly, impudently enter into his presence like Nadab and Abihu, without a care in the world but for themselves. As I finish, Jeremiah Burroughs, the 17th century Puritan, commenting on this passage, said this, Fire came down from heaven in a way of mercy to consume the sacrifices, but now fire comes down from heaven in a way of judgment to consume the sacrificers. My friends, let's remember we have a great high priest who did not shrink back from offering the sacrifice. He stayed focused to the task in Gethsemane, before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, before the cross. And as it were, fire came down 
from heaven in a way of judgment to consume the sacrificer who was removed from the presence of the Lord to a place of rejection in order that fire might come down from heaven in a way of mercy to consume and rescue us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we realize that these these are hard words. They are strong words. And yet, Lord, we know that they are for our good and that we must approach you with due diligence and watchfulness, that you are a holy God and that we're not just playing at being church, we're not just playing at our service, but that, Lord, that we need to take what we've been called to, the Christian life, seriously. And I pray that your spirit will stir us up, that we would spur one another on and encourage one another in the works and in good deeds, that we wouldn't weary of doing good, but, Lord, that we would set our faces like flint, and, Lord, we would press on towards the goal. So, Lord, help us to be those that offer pure sacrifices, that we do not waver, that we do not look to please ourselves, but we look to please you, that you might smile on our offering. Amen. Amen.